happy to provide you this talk on physical aspects of stereotactic body radiotherapy. This is a talk that I delivered at uh, CMC Velo uh, a couple of years ago in a conference and I thought I will provide it in the e-learning platform so that it may be useful for someone who wants to learn stereotactic body radiotherapy. The order of presentation for me will be as given here. I will give some introduction to SBRT. We'll talk on imaging for SBRT. I will touch upon important aspects such as motion management, treatment planning and treatment delivery. And also talk to you about patient specific QA, which may be necessary if someone is using IMRT or VMAT for stereotactic body radiotherapy. From stereotactic radio surgery, to stereotactic body radiotherapy. Before I talk on this transition, I would like to give you some introduction to how and when SRS was started in CMC Velo. CMC Velo was the first institution in India to acquire the stereotactic radio surgery system from radionics, the X knife system, way back in 1995. We started our first patient, if I remember correctly, somewhere in June 1995 and till this 2000, we have done more than 2500 cranial stereotactic radio surgery. And we recently moved from, not moved from, we also started, I would say, stereotactic body radiotherapy. The principles and practice of SBRT were transferred from the cranial stereotactic SRS or SI and SRT. The frame-based stereotactic setup has been replaced by image guidance. Some would argue that this renders the term stereotactic misleading because we don't have any more the frame-based system for SBRT. In my opinion and in the opinion of several, the external coordinate system or frame based is now replaced by the internal coordinate system provided by the image guidance. But you still have the three dimensional coordinate system which is stereotactic. So the term stereotactic is still. What is the definition of stereotactic body radiotherapy? SBRT is defined as a method of external beam radiotherapy that accurately delivers a high dose of radiation to an extracranial target in one or a few treatment fractions. So the definition goes like this. Number one, it is an external beam radiotherapy which accurately delivers a high dose of radiation to an extracranial target in one or a few fractions. So this is the definition of SBRT. So one has to note few things. One is it's an external beam radiotherapy and it delivers high dose of radiation to an extracranial target in a few fractions or maybe in one fraction. What is the rationale for SBRT? The radiobiological rationale for SBRT is the same as that of SRS. That is, you are delivering in a few fractions large dose in a relatively short overall time. Your, your number of fractions is low and it is a relatively short overall time and you are delivering a large dose and this will result in a more potent biological effect. The other reason could be a rapid fall off of dose outside the target which is certainly a big advantage as you will be saving a lot of normal tissues and it will pay way for dose escalation. The clinical outcomes of SBRT are comparable to surgery with minimal adverse effect. And more importantly, you are using limited number of treatment fractions, which are very convenient for patient and it is certainly more cost effective treatment. What are the sites and criteria for SBRT? SBRT started with lung, liver and spine, but many other sites like kidney, prostate, and METs are being now included. But the majority of SPRT are those with lung, liver and spinal tumors. Well circumcised tumors with a maximum cross section of diameter up to 5 cm 
is what is recommended for SBRT. But some centers have said they have gone up to 7 centimeters. SBRT as a boost in addition to regional nodal irradiation is also practiced. Immobilization and simulation which are important for stereotactic body radiotherapy. The sim scan for simulation is as usual a CT scan done but PET CT and MR if required and PET CT and MR are done then it is fused with CT to provide the tumor volume. The slice thickness in your CT should be less than or equal to 3 mm. Since we are working with very small tumor, you should not go beyond 3 mm. Immobilization, you can use black lock or knee fixation or a body fix or anything that would keep the patient in, pos in position for the treatment. Coming on to motion management, free breathing is used if the tumor motion is not very extensive. In that case, people use the concept of ITV, that is the internal target volume, where the target volume will encompass the tumor motion also. Body abdominal compression plate could be used, which is which will reduce the tumor motion due to breathing. Similarly, the pressure belt also will reduce the tumor motion. Breath hold technique is another method where one could ask the patient to hold the breath during the treatment so the tumor doesn't move during the treatment. The respiratory motion is the important thing as far as the SPRT is concerned, particularly lung or abdomen if you are doing, the respiratory motion is an issue. Significant intrafraction movement in abdomen due to respiration. It is very important as I said for lung and liver treatment. A patient specific tumor motion assessment is recommended. You cannot just generalize it. You have to do for each patient. Active motion management is recommended for GTV excursion of exceeds 5 mm. This is what I said. If it is greater than 5 mm, then you have to do a motion management. If it is less than or equal to less than 5 mm, probably you can use ITV concept, which I discussed in the previous slide. You can either use min IP for liver or max IP for lung. Gator treatment is another option for SBRT. Gator treatment is the one where the dose is delivered during a particular phase of the respiratory cycle. If you look at this, let me say this is uh, the phase at which the treatment is given. Again, when the patient breathing comes to the same level, the treatment is given. And then again, the patient breathing cycle comes to the same phase, treatment is given. The rest of the time, there is no beam on. So the beam, in, beam is on only during this time, only during this, only during this. This reduces the probability of delivering dose to normal tissue or underdosing the target. But it increases the delivery time because you have to wait for the breathing of the rest of the patient for rest of the phase and then the beam will start when the breathing comes to the same phase again. So that it increases the delivery time. Affected by the reproducibility of patient's breathing pattern. See, the breathing pattern is not going to be the same every day. As you can see, here I have breathing pattern for three days of the same patient and it significantly varies, right? So the breathing patient pattern is not the same. Then there is an interplay between the mobile target and the dynamic collimator, multi-leaf collimator which can compromise the accuracy of IMRT VMAT dose delivery. This is very, very pronounced if you are doing a single fraction or a few fractions. If you are doing several fractions, then, you know, this gets smeared off and this interplay is not a major issue. But if you are doing a single fraction or just a few fractions, the interplay between the tumor motion and the multi-leaf collimator movement can compromise the accuracy of your VMAT or IMRT dose delivery. So if you are doing 3D CRT, it's not an issue. But if you are doing IMRT or VMAT, this interplay could be an issue. Abdominal compression. 
This is the abdominal compression place that I mentioned, which will reduce the tumor motion, that is the respiratory motion. So the respiratory plate actually places pressure on the level of the diaphragm, reduces the respiratory motion. But there have been some studies which says respiratory belt provides pneumatic compression and immobilization to the patient, but there is inconsistency in reduction of abdominal respiratory motion. It is not the same every day. There is an inconsistency. So one has to be careful that you bring it to the same level and the reduction in abdominal respiratory motion is the same every day. The breath hold technique which we follow in CMC Velo, this is a voluntary patient to hold, voluntarily the patient is expected to hold the breath at either full inspiration or full expiration. The patient is trained or I could say coached for three days before imaging. On the fourth day we do the imaging and the video coaching increases the patient cooperation. We use a video coaching for the patient which actually helps the patient to hold the breath at the same level. Image acquired during the breath hold and the free breathing image is also acquired in the same session. There are a few respiratory motion monitoring devices. This is an interesting device which I had an opportunity to see it in Japan. This is called the Arches device. I hope I pronounce it correctly. This has got two fulcrums called A and B as you can see here. These are the two fulcrums and it's attached to a device here which has got a pointer C. The pointer will move either this or this direction depending on the breathing motion. And if the patient holds the breath, it will come to a position and stop there. And you can put a clip and at that point. And this is watched in a video camera at the control. And in case the patient, you know, changes the breath, you know, breathes and it moves, then they have to stop the treatment. This system which you see here is not uh, interfaced to the linear accelerator. So one has to manually stop it. But now I understand they have a, a device which is interfaced to the LINAC and it can automatically stop and start the treatment depending on the patient breathing position. We use the very popular variant RPM device and I'm sure everybody knows about it. It has got an infrared source and the camera which is fixed onto the wall in the linear accelerator room and it has got a marker block which has got six neon markers which can reflect the infrared back to the camera and as the block moves and the moment is traced by the camera and plotted on the control of the variant RPM device control computer of the variant RPM device. You need to have two of this, one on the linear accelerator and one on the CT simulator room. In the CT simulator room, I'm going to talk to you something different about it now. Um, there are two ways of fixing the RPM camera. Normally, they fix it onto the couch, at the end of the couch. I don't have a picture of it. Or you can fix it onto the wall like this. I prefer fixing onto the wall because you'd never touch it, right? You don't need to calibrate it every time. Whereas if you fix it onto the patient couch, it is convenient in one way that the system captures the motion of the block only in this frame, that is in the two dimension, X and maybe Y. When the couch moves during the scan, the camera also moves along with it. So the distance between the marker block and the camera is same if you fix it onto the couch. But if you fix it onto the wall, the distance between the marker block and the camera changes as the couch moves. This brings in a problem that you have to calibrate it differently. You have your calibration should take into account this motion also. So Marian has provided a software which is called the 10 point calibration where you keep this block at 10 different points along this and note the position. 
the calibration normally doesn't change unless you touch the camera or uh, you know move it it normally doesn't change but it's a good practice to check this calibration by keeping the block at iso center on a daily basis that we do you cannot proceed actually without doing that calibration but this to do this 10 point calibration to make it easy we made a small jig where we noted the positions of the marker block for all the 10 points so next time when we do we don't need to search for the position we just go to the same couch position and move the block from here to here or here 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 and then note the point on the computer so it has made our life easy as far as the 10 point calibration is concerned and we have the wall mounted uh, camera here let me now explain to you how we do the breath hole scans the breath hole scans are obtained using the rpm device in the simulator as i told you we do three days training for the patient and then do the scan on the fourth day we put the marker block and we give a video goggle to the patient which is connected to the rpm control computer this connection was done by us you know we actually bought a converter and connected this uh, video goggle to it so the patient could see the entire screen you know that's the only negative thing about doing it ourselves actually variant provides only either this screen or this screen i think they provide this screen in their system but here the entire monitor, monitor sorry the rpm uh, computer screen will be available for the patient on this video goggle we tell the patient please look at this line and it should not go above this blue or below this red during the breath hold and the patient is able to look at it and control the breathing level at the same point during ct and during the treatment so this is how we acquire it and then when we do the treatment also the patient will have a video goggle so we have two sets of so the choice of the equipment breath controlled delivery or a gated delivery patients should be able to hold the breath for 15 to 20 seconds if you are doing a breath hold technique reproducibility of a, the depth of the breath hold is very important you know we had an interesting incident when we started it actually way back i mean some few years ago when we first started particularly we started it for breast uh, left breast treatment where the patient was able to hold the breath to the same level for three four days in ct but when we came onto the lenac room the patient was not able to the environmental change was an issue the temperature you know everything was an issue the patient was not able to hold the breath at the same level so because of that we decided that one day we saturday probably we will bring the patient to the treatment room and try it once before we really start the treatment that really helped to during our initial days and of course i mentioned the training of the patient the more important thing is the training of the staff the staff has to guide the patient and tell the patient hold the breath or relax this has to be done properly by the patient uh, staff who is doing the treatment there so this is another important thing that you have to note we had to give training to the staff to tell the patient hold the breath start the treatment and relax once the treatment is complete for the particular field the flow of the dibh treatment is as given here we do a dibh video coaching for 3 days free breathing ct and a dibh ct with the video coaching are taken in the same setting right and a we do a plan on the free breathing ct and a plan on the dibh ct and the dibh plan is better than free breathing then you do sbrt with the dibh if it is not we do a free breathing with the daily imaging of course for this the tumor extraction cannot be more than 5 mm otherwise we have to do some other method of reducing it to 5 mm like the compression belt or abdominal compression coming on to treatment planning i would like to touch upon some important uh, concepts here in treatment planning one is the choice of the energy whether you will go for a 6 mv or a 10 mv where to use 6 mv and where to use 10 mv 
and what is the choice of your dose rate whether you will go for regular 600 mu per minute or would you like to go for 1400 and 2400 with triple up beam on choice of technique would you be happy with the 3d crt with non coplanar beams or you would like to do imrt or vmat choice of energy we will look at the choice of energy one would prefer 6 mv for lung the reason being higher the beam energy larger the beam penumbra due to lateral electron transport in the medium i am not sure how many of you really thought about this as the energy increases beyond 4 or maybe 6 mv the penumbra increases because the electrons emitted at the edge of the beam will travel longer than for 10 mv or 15 mv than for 6 mv so this will increase the penumbra if you go through my talk i think in an external beam radiotherapy i have explained it little more in detail and lung being a low density medium the effect becomes more significant for lung so one would prefer to use 6 mv for lung not, not to use high energies use of 10 mv for liver and other lesions have become more common because the advantage here is if you use 10 mv you have higher dose rate choice of dose rate use of high dose rate would shorten the treatment delivery particularly when you are giving a very high dose of 18 gray or so in single fraction short treatment time would also help treatment of moving organs like the, you don't allow the organ to move too much like with a short treatment time will reduce gated treatment time if you are doing gated treatment certainly this will reduce the gated treatment time i have been saying triple up beam and double up beam let me give some introduction to what is flattening filter or why flattening filter and why that is being removed now let us first see why a flattening filter actually i have given you another lecture on triple up beam if you go through that there will be more detail on this but just for continuity sake i will say a few things about the flattening filter here the Brunstall and photons in the MEV range produced with the transmission target is forward peaked. So the Brunstall and produced here for high energy is more forward peaked. You see the beam going like this. And if you look at the profile, it will be like this. You know, I have not seen this profile before the triple F came because you cannot remove the flattening filter on your own to do that but uh, it is interesting to see that if you don't have flattening filter you have a forward peak both the energy and intensity variation of the primary photon fluence with emission angle you know the both the intensity as well as the energy varies with this emission angle like as it goes if you read the H. E. john's book you will understand this much more clearer if you introduce a flattening filter here now the beam becomes flat you can argue with me now it is not really flat man it is still there is a depth and this is because you are using a flattening filter which is made for a particular field size and we go for other field sizes particularly larger field sizes there is a tendency of more attenuation at the middle and less at the edges which is referred to as the horns and of course you get a nearly flat beam here so this is why the flattening filter was introduced at the first place we discussed about the introduction of flattening filter but what are its implications the number one implication is it substantially reduced the dose rate of the beam it reduced the dose rate considerably and the flattening filter in the head introduces a lot of scattered photons it is the major source of head scatter the flattening filter and it is made of high z material which actually hardens the beam beam hardening happens it removes the soft x-rays double f that is the flattening filters are placed on a low z material which reduces the electrons produced in the thin target helps in cooling the target therapeutic beams of energy higher than 8 mv produce neutrons it's called uh, photoneutron production because of the interaction with the beam defining system and the flattening filter is one of the main source of neutron production for high energy beams 
The next question I have is, can we use the triple F theme for planning, particularly in the case of 3D CRT? No problem if you are using IMRT or VMAT, whatever the shape of the profile that is taken care of in VMAT and IMRT. But if you are using 3D CRT, can you use a triple F beam? So in order to test this, I want I wanted to compare the double F and triple F beam profiles. This is for a one by one field and you see both overlap and you don't see any difference between a double F and triple F beam. When you go to two by two, again, you don't see any difference. They look the same. And when you go to 3x3, three three, I don't see any difference here. Uh, they just overlap the double F and triple F beam profiles. And when I go to 4x4, four four, I see a small difference. So my conclusion is up to 3x3, three three, there is no problem. We can still use triple F for 3D CRT, even up to 4x4. Four four. There isn't a big difference. Of course, there is a little larger penumbra in the case of triple F beam. When you go to 5x5, five five, sorry, 6x6, six six, you see that it's a little more prominent here. 8x8, eight eight, you see the triple F beam has a larger penumbra here. And we go to 10x10, ten ten, again, it's much larger. Of course, for 12x12, 12 12, it will be much larger. So, I can conclude here up to 3x3 three three or 4x4, no, four four, I would be able to use triple F beam for 3D CRT. Beyond that, it, you should not be using it because it will increase the penumbra and the tumor coverage will naturally suffer because of that. What should be the choice of technique? Should you use 3D conformal 3D CRT with multiple non coplanar with the 6 or 10 MB triple F beams? or use IMRT with five or nine beams or a VMAT single or multiple double arc maybe, right? So we will look at this one, which should be the choice of your technique. We did, I did a small case study. I took a liver lesion with 3.8 centimeter diameter equivalent uh, tumor. We did VMAT plan, plans with six X, six triple F, 10 triple F. Of course, this was the dose prescription. I did a comparison with the plan that I got for VMAT with 6X and 6 F, and uh, I don't see any major difference in the beam, uh, sorry, DVH. As you can see, I used a single half, half arc here because it is a one sided tumor, and uh, it is actually a single half arc to be very correct. And I don't see a big difference, of course, there is a small difference here in the critical organ doses, but it's not very, very significant. Again, I compared 6 triple F and 10 triple F with VMAT of single arc. I didn't see a big difference. You know, as I have been telling you, how you choose your energy or the triple F depends on mostly on the location. If it is lung, go for 6 MB. If it is liver, you can go for 10 MB. The advantage of going for 10 MB is just that your triple F has got a higher dose rate. And I also tried 10 triple F with a single arc and double half arcs, like single and double. You can see there is a difference. The differences in double arc gives a much better DVH for the tumor coverage. Now the question is, you know, you will be able to get good DVH by different permutation combination. You are a good planner, you will get it. But what I want you to concentrate is in this slide. What I have done is in this slide, I have tabulated the parameters that were derived from the treatment plans that I showed you in the previous slides, such as the V95, V50, etc. Interestingly, I have also got you the MU for various plans. And MU for 6X is about 2090, whereas for 6 triple F for the same half arc, it is 2073. But with 6 triple F with 2 half arcs, it is 1843 and 10 triple F is 1900, not a big difference between them. But when you go to 10 triple F with 2 arcs, it is 1687. However, when you look at the time, which actually I calculated from the field parameters in the plan, is about 200 seconds for 6x, it's more than 3 minutes. And for 6 triple F, it is 84 seconds, 6 triple F with 2 half arcs is 80 seconds. 10 triple F is 44 seconds with single arc 
and same ten triplet for the two half hours is about sixty seconds. So the treatment time actually is very less when you use ten triplet. Of course, for abdomen, I would prefer going in for ten triplet. For you know lung, it would be ideal to use uh, six triplet, where the treatment time will be approximately eighty-four seconds. Uh, you know, this is just an example. I do understand if a different planner does it, it will be totally different. So it's not a point for debate, but it is just a comparison between doing six x six triplet with the single arc, double arc. 10 triple up single art and double art so svrt planning consideration as i said earlier tomographic slice thickness should be 1 to 3 mm and if you are doing 3d crt use large number of non coplanar beams so that you get a very good coverage and significant dose fall off outside the tumor volume Use of triplet beams for small lesions is an advantage when you do 3D CRT. Dose calculation grid should be less than 2 mm. Don't keep a larger grid because you are working with very small tumors. Low energy for lung and small or no beam margins for penumbra. IMRT and VMAT could also produce steep dose gradient. So one would prefer to use this, but it depends like if you are comfortable doing 3d crt you can do that if you are comfortable doing imrt v mat you should do that but one thing is if you are doing imrt v mat you will have to do a patient specific q there are different methods by which the treatment can be delivered sbrt should have image guidance either it is kvcb ct or mvcb ct mvct or tumor tracking you know one of these should be there and the image guidance for sbrt that we used is using a kvcbct matching using bone landmarks one cbct between the arc if more than one arc is used particularly in vmat or imrt it is better to do an one cbct in between and if there is an opportunity to do fiducials implant fiducials that would be helpful there is a paper which says fiducial markers are necessary for accurate delivery of liver sbrt certainly it will improve the accuracy of fiducials but it is an additional procedure that if you are willing to if you have the facility it's well and good to do that the other tracking device that people use is the calypso electromagnetic system i'll just give a small introduction to it because it's an interesting physics item here and the calypso electromagnetic system has got beacon transponders and these are used for you know locating uh, the tumor and it is an electro it has an electromagnetic array and it uses a kv couch the regular carbon fiber couch should not be used so you have to replace the couch if you are using calypso with this kv couch the calypso system has got the uh, three camera ports here you can see that there are three cameras i'll explain how actually it works so the calypso system also has got an array here it is called the electromagnetic array this is that array this array has got you can see here optical target these are you know uh, infrared reflectors so these reflectors actually reflect the infrared from the camera that you saw on the ceiling and these are the beacons right now this actually has a two way detection system that's quite interesting that's the main reason i kept it here the position of the beacon in the patient is picked up by this electromagnetic array right the position of the array with this is the isocenter marking here which will call a coincide with the beam isocenter the position of the array is picked up using this reflective markers by the camera so camera can finally note the position of the beacon transponders in the patient so this is a two way detection as i said the beacon transponders are detected by the array electromagnetic array and the position of the electromagnetic array is by the cameras so finally you get the position of the beacon transponders one more point i would like to show on this picture is the kv couch you see this is not the carbon fiber couch you have to change it if you have the carbon fiber couch you know it won't identify the beacons 
the electromagnetic array will not work. I did try it actually. It didn't work. And it has to be calibrated daily and there is a calibration jig provided by the company. So the beacons are implanted into this and the surface transponders are also provided. You can you can use it on the patient's surface also, not necessarily you have to implant. Nowadays they provide the surface transponders. Initial calibration is a two-way camera calibrated for room coordinate and transponders calibrated with the beacon position. And the next thing for SBRT anyone would say is needed is the 6D couch. In my opinion, it is not absolute necessity, but if you have, it's good. And it can provide you, you know, the tilt with pitch, yaw and roll. It can correct for the angular variation, but in the maximum correction can be only three degrees, right? So this correction can be applied using this. And the last thing is the quality assurance for SBRT. As I said, if you are doing IMRT or VMAT, patient specific QA is necessary. And the important thing here is SBRT is a small field. So the choice of the detector is very important when you do the QA. You have to be careful about the small field dosimetry, which of course is another subject we can talk another day. Small volume chamber for isocenter dose measurement. And high resolution detector array is important as the SBRT volumes are very small. Here also I would say if the volume is very small, I wouldn't use an ion chamber. I would rather go for a very small diode to know the dose at the isocenter. Right? And one method of getting a good uh, fluence detection is using a Gafkrovic film and or you can even try portal dosimetry. Gel dosimetry is certainly a beautiful device for this but it is little time consuming and labor intensive. The QA recommendations are here. Summary of the published QA recommendations for SBRT and SBRT related techniques and this actually I took from the APM report on SBRT Please refer to this for various QA methods. I know when you start an SBRT procedure, you need to do an end-to-end -end accuracy, end-to-end -end test. So end-to-end -end means from your simulation to the actual treatment execution. So every step in this should be tested. So this is what the end-to-end -end test. And whenever you start a new technique, particularly if it is going to be such something like very important one like SBRT where you give very high dose then end-to-end -end testing as a part of commissioning is very important. So the commissioning of SBRT as I said earlier you need to do an end-to-end -end test and you have to test each individual components like positioning, immobilization, motion management, image guidance and treatment delivery. It would be nice if you are testing motion management, you have some system like a breathing phantom to do it. But if you're doing breath hold technique, this is not a must, but we did try even for breath hold a phantom, you know, the moving phantom and made it hold the breath at a point and then do it. It was helpful to train the staff also on how to, uh, when to say relax and when to stay hold the breath. As one would decide to start SBRT, here are some cautions for it. Pulmonary function and the volume of normal liver that is a radiator or most immediate consideration. Tumor proximal to mainstem bronchi, trachea, esophagus, gastric wall, bowel, blood vessels or spinal cord should be approached with caution. You have to be very careful when you are trying to treat any of this. Or not at all if the lack of spatial separation places them within the high dose gradient region of treatment. Don't do this if you feel they are in the high dose gradient and there is a possibility that you may give high dose to the normal tissues. SBRT should not be pursued as a treatment option if 
the target and radio sensitive critical structures cannot be localized on a sectional imaging with sufficient accuracy because of motion or metal artifacts. If you say you are not able to define the tumor volume or the critical organs properly, SBRT is not the treatment option. These are my references. Uh, mainly I took from Stereotactic Body Radiotherapy, the APM task group. And of course I took from the other two also. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope